what's going down, y'all. Come the worst, my peoples come first. You know the worst come 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 the worst. We're just uh, putting out some of the devices that we'll be talking about today. Um, so before we really get started with the talk properly, I want to do some um, um, expectation management, right? So essentially, this is Marie's story. It's not really my story. I think it's an amazing story. I don't think she needs my help to tell this story, but I am a little bit of a part of the story. So mostly I'm just here as kind of hacker arm candy. I'm just going to stand up here and look pretty and ask Marie certain questions um, because it's such an amazing uh, story that she's got to tell. So we did do this talk before um, at CCC, and we also did a talk at RSA. And one of the things we both were interested in for a long time was um, cyber physical systems and vulnerabilities that affect real world stuff. Um, so this is kind of a talk about that. Um, essentially, the internet was virtual at one time, or at least that's how we thought about it. Um, we thought that harm could only be virtual. When we were just talking about data, then any hacking would be um, changing files or reading files, invasions of privacy. Um, these are the kind of traditional security domains that, that we grew up with or we thought. But I, I argue that the harm was never virtual. Even if you just changed an email, um, as, a, as a great example, there was a guy who got out of prison recently by forging an email. You know? In 1992, I think I spoofed my first email by telnetting into port 25, right? But it still works to this day. And this guy got himself out of jail with a spoofed email. So my point here is very simple. These systems affect the real world, and they always have. We just had this kind of misconception. Um, so oh. IT and OT. We'll say a little bit more about that. Um, how does this play out? If we start to talk about vulnerabilities being embodied and the effects on us, you know, literally in Marie's case, um, how is this going to play out? You know this story about IT and OT and theoretically the uh, competition between these, these two groups, but we can see that they were aiming at physical world web, right? Um, and this has been the, the case over time. So as vulnerabilities become embodied, the harm becomes embodied, right? The privacy invasions become real. They affect you on a kind of physical uh, level where you are in the world, um, inside your own body, power grids, automated vehicles, all of these things will have embodied vulnerabilities. Teleoperation and telepresence will have a new sort of class of uh, harms and effects on our lives. And I think that will become very obvious as we go through, go through the rest of the talk. Do you want to say a few words so I'm not just uh, yeah, waffling so on? For those of you that don't know me, uh, I actually have a medical implant inside of my own body. So vulnerabilities in this implant is embodied in my body, which is sort of uh, why we're giving this talk. So I started a research project um, about a year ago together with Aaron on hacking pacemakers because I wanted to know if my own critical pers personal critical infrastructure was secure and safe. So that's my background. And I'm going to give you a lot of stories about this in mm. this talk. Um, it's worth saying as well that this, uh, this journey has been kind of crazy. When Maria first um, asked me to work on the project, well, you didn't, you didn't ask me to work on the project. We had worked on some stuff uh, on industrial systems, um, the Shodan research that some of you remember me for. Um, I did that, and I sent some of the vulnerabilities to, to NORSERT, well, to ICS CERT, who sent them to NORSERT, and Maria handled them. And then she told me about this uh, pacemaker stuff, and she asked if I could introduce her to Barnaby Jack, who was uh, another fantastic researcher who worked with us at IOActive and, and sadly passed away before I could introduce them. And at that point, I felt really awkward. I'd never done any pacemaker hacking or medical device hacking. I'm an ICS guy. I'm a hard hat hacker. That's all I've ever done, right? Um, but she asked if I would help out, and I thought, Right, I do embed it, let's just go for it, right? And that's kind of how this story got started. Um, so one of the things I think is interesting is um, IoT, right? 
And when we talk about the pacemaker and the rest of this uh, research, it's not just the pacemaker that is, that is um, part of the food chain, if you like, right? So we've got the home monitoring units. We've got a couple different of them here. Um, these sit in your house, and they keep track of the pacemaker data. They basically pull data from, from the pacemaker, and then that can go across a modem line uh, to somewhere else in the world, and your doctor can access it. And it might not be, it might be a, a cable modem, or it might be a GSM modem, depending on which products we're talking about. Uh, usually, you have them at your bedside, and then during the night, it will uh, start communicating with the pacemaker wirelessly. Um, in my case, uh, my condition is not so that I need this uh, very close monitoring. So I have it switched off, but it's a capability of my implant, so it can be switched on. So uh, I didn't know about this uh, extra wireless interface on my pacemaker before I stu studied the technical manual of my pacemaker after I had it implanted. No one told me that I was going to be essentially a human part of the Internet of Things well, by having this thing inside of me. And yeah, that's uh, also part of my motivation for looking into the security of my device. Because I think the, that's... Yeah, the, the, the pacemaker technology is like from the 60s, so like the pace, pacing functionality has been tested and uh, been used for a long time. So I trust that part of my pacemaker but then you add the connectivity afterwards uh, because of this uh, uh, telemedicine and you want to monitor patients. And of course, a lot of patients, they benefit from this. Uh, so I'm not against uh, the option of having, the, having this. But at the same time, that's the part of the ecosystem of the medical implant that I have that I'm most worried about the security because this is added afterwards. And uh, if you know how long it takes to get these devices out on the market, um, and also... Uh, it takes a lifetime, right? It takes <laughs> like maybe five, ten years, and then uh, it has a battery lifetime of ten years. Uh, so I had this in my body for five years now. Uh, so potentially this technology is at least 15 years old, and it's like wireless connectivity of my implant. So that's why I'm worried about that part. Mm. I think this stuff is um, amazingly intense, and this is why when we had these conversations, I started um, thinking about a lot of uh, other factors, and I think the most amazing part of that is the lack of consent. The, the idea that we can all opt out of Facebook and thus be safe is pervasive. Like, I encounter all sorts of people that say, oh, if I don't connect it to the internet, then it'll be safe, and if I'm not on Facebook, it'll be safe. And I've found many, many different counterexamples to this. And I think Maria's case is a perfect example, right? Like, she didn't get the opportunity to opt in. And this is going to happen with all of these devices. You're not going to get to opt in when uh, most of the vehicles on the road that are automated um, are out there, right? You're just one day going to wake up, and there's going to be more of them on the road, and that's going to be that. So um, how do we keep track of this on a philosophical level? Um, I think it's the growth of actuator sales that's going to define cyber-physical hacking and the types of harm. So if you put a chip in a smart meter, you get one effect. If you put a chip in a car, you get a different effect. If you put it in a medical device, you get a different one. There will be new products coming out as we go forward. Um, and those will mean that different types of harm can come to happen to people, and also privacy invasions. Most of the uh, pacemaker research that has been shown to date has focused on the ability to kill a patient. But I think there's a lot to be said about, uh, about privacy, in particular, um, in working on this project, there have been a, a number of moments that I found very awkward and difficult uh, in our friendship because of doing this kind of research, and we'll talk a little bit more about them uh, later on. So, actuator sales. As actuator sales go up across the world, we're going to have cyber-physical harms of a, of a wide variety. Um, and this gives you some perspective of what it's been doing over the, over the last few years. Um, so. Is anyone aware of the CO2 model? Really? No one? Okay, I'm glad we left this slide in then. All right. Um, 
You've heard of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That's the standard thing. And then we like to say, um, let's get rid of the CIA and reverse it and make it AIC. Um, that's usually how the story goes, right? But we think that the model actually was very broken. And it's better to talk about operability, observability, and controllability. Now, when I give credit for this model, it's a little bit of a challenge. Marina worked on it with Klaus Kosawe, and then some other people talked about it. I talked about it with Jason Larson around a pool, and then some other people talked about it. So it's difficult to attribute, but essentially it formed out of conversations at various conferences like this. And I think it speaks very uh, clearly about the types of harm that we're concerned with in industrial control systems, but I also think it speaks about the types of harm uh, that Marie is facing uh, while doing this research. So what is the same? between big and little infrastructure. As part of this discussion, I was working in Cambridge on critical infrastructure stuff and uh, doing a bunch of mathematics around critical infrastructure and statistics. And I realized that you know, this passion project that we had where we were hacking on pacemaker devices, um, you know, this was your critical, personal critical infrastructure. Yeah. And I just found that really fascinating, right? Like some of the same issues that apply to critical infrastructure, whether it's defined to be critical infrastructure or not, um, is an issue, right? And here she is uh, literally depending on it. Do you want to say any more about that? Yeah, I have a slide coming up later. I will show how much I'm actually depending on it. So, okay. Yeah. It's, all right. my, it's, it's critical for me that uh, the pacemaker is working at all times. I mean, it's self-evident, right? Mm. So the cost of failure here is embedded. Um, it's embodied, right? When the cost of failure was losing a file on a server, that cost was theoretically caught in some economic system that the computer participated in. But once this happens in the real world, um, it's very different, right? And we know this graph, at least I hope all of you know this graph, about the cost of fixing um, bugs in code. Forget whether they're security vulnerabilities or not, right? Um, this comes from NIST. I think it's amazing. I used to be a quality assurance person long before um, I stood up here on the stage. And you know, getting it right earlier in the life cycle of the, of the product was the right way to go, right? But what happens when we have uh, production post-release embodied vulnerabilities in the real world, right? When it's traffic lights, when it's water systems, when it's physical stuff. And when it's embodied, uh, if my pacemaker has um, a hardware failure or some, something wrong with the pacemaker that can't be uh, patched, uh, I would have, a, uh, have to have a surgery to get it replaced. And this is the reality for a lot of patients uh, right now, actually. Uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, one brand of uh, pacemakers or ICDs, which is a different type of uh, uh, heart implant that can also deliver shocks. Uh, has a recall right now because of uh, problems with its battery. The battery can essentially run out in one day uh, because of this. And people are waiting to have surgery uh, to get replacements uh, because of this recall. Uh, and of course, it's a lot of like, it takes time. And patients are not uh, uh, always aware of this. And there are different ways of contacting the patients and and getting this uh, actually done and fixed. So, and even if you want to do, do uh, like a, a software update or patch of the firmware of the pacemaker, you would have to put, pull the patients in to the hospital to, to get this done. So it's like, a, it's a huge issue when you find vulnerabilities in this, uh, uh, in this uh, medical implants. Um, so while there are right now recalls because of this battery, problem with St. Jude medical devices. At the same time, uh, the MedSec and Madhu Waters um, released this vulnerabilities uh, to the public uh, about security vulnerabilities that are in the same types of, uh, uh, of implants. And their ad advice is to turn off the remote monitoring unit uh, because of, uh, it's possible to hack the uh, monitoring a unit and use it to drain the battery of the pacemaker. But at the same time, the same devices are on recall because there's a hardware problem or there's a problem with battery uh, so that uh, patients are waiting to get, uh, get replacement and while they are waiting, they need to be closely monitored in case the battery runs out too early. And the strong advice 
from the manufacturer is you need to have the home monitoring unit on at all time and not like travel away from it because you need to be closely monitored. So those are like ethical questions that mm -hmm. we also will touch on in this. And you see the similarities here between industrial control systems, right? Like, you know, oh, it's got to be connected to the internet so I can work with the vendor on synchronizing, blah, 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 blah whatever. Um, or I remove it, but then I can't have some sort of operational control to my substations or whatever. So this kind of critical infrastructure, I can't turn it off, high availability stuff, is not just industrial control systems. It also turns out to be, to be medical devices. Now, um, I was lucky enough to work on a, on a paper with Ross Anderson and Richard uh, Clayton very recently on software liability and regulation in, in the European um, market. And at one point, Ross Anderson said something brilliant, which is that um, updates are optimized product recall. And I, it, it was brilliant to me. I'd never thought of it this way, right? But if you can remotely update the firmware of something, you don't have to um, spend the money to have the product brought back to you and fixed. So it's like an optimized, cheapest possible way to replace uh, that thing with a thing that works properly as quickly and cheaply as possible. Right? So updates are going to become very important for IoT, and I know you all know that. So let's get on with uh, the more medical side of the talk and the more exciting uh, part of the talk, which is Marie's story. Okay, as I already told you that I have my personal critical infrastructure. If you switch to the next slide. Sure. Um, that's the heart. How many of you know how the heart works? Like the electrical system of the heart? Okay, I'm going to explain it a little bit then. Uh, so what happens when your heart beats is that there's a small electrical signal generated in the sinus node of the heart. And this electrical signal travels down from the upper heart chamber to the lower heart chamber. And while it travels, it uh, uh, crosses this um, yellow thing called the AV node. And there's a small delay uh, which is caused by the AV node so that you get uh, a uh, good pumping effect of the heart by having like kadung, kadung rhythm. So, so you first want the, the upper heart, uh, heart chamber to contract and then the lower ch heart chamber like in a synchronized fashion and with this delay. In my case, what suddenly happened to me five years ago is that my electrical signals were disturbed. Means that uh, they actually stop in the AV node for me. So the electrical signal is not traveling down to the ventricles, the lower heart chamber. And I noticed this uh, by suddenly losing consciousness because my heart took a break. So it stopped for a while. I just found myself lying on the floor and I had no idea it had something to do with my heart, but I went into the emergency room and they did a, a heart monitoring of me and they saw that I had a problem with my electrical signals. So luckily, there's a backup function in, built into the heart. It means that if the lower heart chambers don't get the signal, there are some cells in there that can produce this signal and take over the pacemaker functionality. But this uh, heartbeat uh, that is, is uh, poorly regulated doesn't get all the uh, signals from the nerve system, so it doesn't recognize that you need more oxygen because you're running, for instance and it's usually very low frequency. So my pulse was around 40 beats per minute when this happened to me and my sort of backup system, the, my, my biological backup system was in place. And when this happens, when you have this total blockage of the signal, uh, you're also in high risk of sudden cardiac death because of, uh, uh, it can become unsynchronized and you can have long breaks. So that's what happened to me. And I needed the pacemaker to uh, stay alive, basically. And this is, uh, here you can see uh, some of the electronics inside of me. So this is from one of the pacemakers that we opened up in the lab and looked inside. So you can see this electronics that is under my skin and keeping me alive and keeping me running. And this uh, graph is from uh, a previous checkup that I did. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, this that's is one, uh, of them. This is one yeah. of them. Uh, you'll you'll have a chance similar, to see it a little bit yeah. later downstairs. Uh, and here you can see that I'm 100% dependent on the pacemaker because the first line, which is a straight line, uh, is uh, telling how 
often my ventricle is paced. So 100% of the time, this is during 24 hours. And you can see the bottom line is for how often my atria is paced. That's the upper heart chamber. Um, some patients need that pacing too. But in my case, uh, the, I have two wires going from the pacemaker down to the heart. Uh, one is to the atrium and the other to the ventricle. The atrium one is essentially just sensing, it's a sensor. And it, if my pulse drops below 50 beats per minute, it will kick in and it will start also pacing the atria. That's why you can see that uh, I get some pacing uh, at night because I'm sleeping and my pulse is lower than 50 beats per minute, which is the setting uh, that it kicks in. Is this a good spot to share that awkward anecdote? <laughs> Of course. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so remember earlier I was saying that I found some of this research very privacy invasive and I wasn't, wasn't sort of expecting it, right? So at one point, not this particular uh, readout, but we were looking at a readout that had been taken from uh, Marie's pacemaker. So you have a pacemaker programmer and it's got a little paddle and you know, it's held close to her heart and then the data comes out and we can view the data. And I, she had gone running. She told me she was running marathons and stuff. And um, so I'm looking at the data and like in the middle of the day on a Saturday, uh, this particular bit of data, I see this spike. And I was like, oh, did, is this when you ran your marathon, right? And Marie turned bright red and was a little <laughs> awkward and uh, told me that this is when she had been with her husband, right? Um, <laughs> And I just found that amazing. Like, you know, you're, you're doing this kind of research and you, you don't stop to think about the fact that you're going to be working with your friend on very, very private data. And another example of that is when we pulled other people's data from the programmer that we had never met before. Hmm. And you see that this was the last time um, that pacemaker was working and it delivered these shocks at these times, right? Yeah, this ICD. We were interrogating an ICD in the lab uh, and we could see, like, the name of the patient and how often the patients had been shocked by this uh, uh, ICD. So we knew exact time of death, essentially, just by looking at this kind of data, right? Mm. Yeah, so it, uh, it stores 24 hours of this uh, statistics. So I already told you a little bit about my motivation for starting the project. Can um, I say a little bit about that as well, just yeah. briefly? So when Maria was first talking to me about this and talking about going to her doctors and asking questions, keep in mind she's a PhD, right? And she did some crypto stuff as a master's and worked at NSM and, you know, cybersecurity professional, goes and asks doctors about stuff. And essentially the responses that you were describing to me sounded like, don't worry, you're pretty little head about it. And that made me really angry, right? Well, and I or, think or just ignorance. They, didn't, they exactly. never thought about the fact that this machine inside of me is running on code and it can potentially have bugs and be hacked. So and we should clarify that a lot of doctors have reached out to help her because mm -hmm. of speaking about this, which is quite amazing. Um, but initially, yeah. Mm. But there was one episode that uh, made me, that this is, was the first time I sort of felt on my body how it feels like to have a device that is not working correctly. This was... Uh, I think it was four weeks after my surgery, five years ago. Uh, I was working at the North Cert at the time, and I was uh, attending a SANS class on ethical hacking in London. Uh, I was feeling fine after the surgery. This was a pretty easy uh, thing, uh, half an hour surgery, and then I had uh, like two weeks sick leave, and I was back uh, working. So I went to London to attend this course, and I was traveling uh, the tube with uh, some of my colleagues, and we went off at this uh, underground station, uh, I think it was Covent Garden, mm. and there are really, really long stairs because this is very deep underground. And there were some elevators, but my colleagues just headed for the stairs because there were long queues to the elevators, and I would just follow them. And as you can see, there are 193 steps to climb equal to a 15-story building, so it's pretty long stairs. And I came about halfway up those stairs, and then I realized something is wrong. Something's not working right. I never felt this kind of uh, exhaustion before. It was like total exhaustion suddenly in the middle of going up the stairs. And I've been like really active, uh, exercising a lot and so on, so I felt kind of fit. So suddenly I felt like an 80-year-old in the middle of the stairs, and I didn't know why. And I went to the, uh, get a checkup when I came back from the class, the hospital. 
And they looked at the programmer that they used to, to adjust the configuration of the pacemaker, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And it took three months until they figured out what was wrong. And it turned out, once my pulse uh, reached 160 beats per minute, there's kind of, um, the, uh, the pacemaker detected this as abnormal in a way. Uh, and it, uh, suddenly my heart rate uh, was switched to 80 beats per second instead. So I needed more oxygen, but I didn't get it, and I felt like an eight years old. And part of this is because of the default settings, they are adapted to an 80-year-old patient because it's the age group that usually gets these implants, not a young, active person like me. So, but there was also the bug. And the problem was there was a bug in the programmer uh, um, HMI. So when the pacemaker technician was looking at the settings, uh, it calculated the upper rate limit, which in my case was 160, but it didn't say 160 on the screen. So there was kind of loss of observability. <laughs> so uh, because of this uh, calculation that was wrong, uh, it, that also complicated the fact that they didn't figure out uh, why this was happening to me. So I needed to do like an exercise test uh, under monitoring to get this sorted out. Essentially, like the cached version of uh, the pacemaker settings wasn't displaying properly, right? Yeah. So, um, same sort of thing you might see on an HMI where the state is different than the HMI shows. And I think that's just amazing. When she first told me this story, I was uh, yeah. breathless. So, that motivated me also to start looking into this because I realized there are bugs in this system. So, and expect to debug yourself or debug <laughs> yeah. uh, the real world, right? Yeah. And this is a, a, a figure that I made after studying the technical manual of my pacemaker when I realized that I have these two communication interfaces. Uh, and I was only aware of the one with the programmer because that's the one they use to adjust the settings and the configuration. So I wasn't aware that we have this uh, uh, mixed medical implant communication service, uh, radio interface, uh, uh, 433 megahertz, uh, that is communicating with a home monitor. So that surprised me, and that also worried me as a security researcher, uh, because I see it as, in uh, as an added attack uh, surface. And essentially these are um, modems. Um, with uh, an interface that speaks the right frequency. Um, and there's a large antenna inside each one of these boxes. So that's, I saw one of the questions earlier, so I'll just address it in the presentation. What are the attack vectors here uh, from a hacker's point of view? One of them is the programmer, if you can get a hold of it. It's essentially just a Windows box. Um, and you import and export data, and there's some compression of the data that goes on. So that's one of the attack vectors. Um, and we're looking into um, that data at this time for, for, um, as a path to take control of the programmer. Um, we don't go into too many details about the vulnerabilities in this talk, and I think you'll understand why. Um, we're still working with vendors and the rest of the team. There are, there are a number of us hacking on different parts of this ecosystem. It's so the other one is the home monitoring unit. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the St. Jude research, uh, which used that as an attack vector as well. Um, and essentially, that's going to be hardware, and then you have a radio communication directly to the pacemaker. And this assumes that you want to attack the pacemaker in the first place. You might just be interested in gathering large amounts of medical data, at which point you would go after the servers or the home monitoring units and, and not try and go for the pacemaker itself. Also, one thing that surprised me is that the uh, data that is uh, collected from the pacemakers uh, and the ICDs is actually stored at the server at the vendor, uh, not in the same country as I live. <laughs> so so <laughs> patient Europe. data is like being exported and under the control of the vendors. and. What are they actually doing with this data? This is really valuable data. For instance, insurance companies might be really interested in getting their hands on this data. And we've yeah. all experienced vendor lock-in and industrial control systems, but imagine it's like your personal <laughs> data, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what can go wrong? There are potential threats uh, that we were looking into when starting this project. So uh, basically, everything can be vulnerable at this Station. Also, you have the human factor to add to this. 
So I already talked about the programmer and it's a, a graphical user interface, not displaying the correct numbers. It's also easy to do mistakes while, while uh, doing the configuration of these devices. You can have human errors that really impacts people's lives. We don't uh, have time to speak about all of the different people oh. who have researched uh, in this field before, but we'll try and name a, a few. Kevin Fu, in particular, did a pacemaker research uh, on a device that was FDA approved. So one of the things you might assume is that, oh, FDA approval means that it's been tested for security. But the whole point of his research was that they broke a pacemaker that had been FDA approved, thus showing that it didn't add any uh, security. The other research I was made aware of uh, was Harold Thimbleby. Now, this is not necessarily security research, but it's safety research. And essentially, he's been researching uh, user interface bugs and errors that can then lead to medical uh, impacts. So he's particularly obsessed with you know, the way you calculate dosages uh, when you're providing anesthesia to a patient, or um, you know, the way you um, would set up the pacemaker in the first place. Right? So these kind of configuration UI errors can lead to deaths as well, regardless of any hacking. Right? Yeah, and of course, uh, you can think about different uh, impacts here, like we already talked about privacy impact. Uh, battery exhaustion, which is a bad one because it leads to surgery to get a replacement. But then you can also, like, you can make the device malfunction. Uh, so if someone switches off my device, that's critical for me uh, because I'm dependent on it. And then, of course, worse scenarios like ransomware on medical devices and uh, uh, remote assassination scenarios. Mm. Um, and even with yeah. the privacy issues, there are some weirder impacts than you might expect, right? So a lot of these pacemakers use the patient name as an identifying uh, string in the, in the radio protocol. So if you, had, uh, if you were listening on the right uh, frequency in random places, you would just get the names of passerby that uh, happen to have a pacemaker, right? And these are some of the pacemakers that we are working on. Um, I think it's really interesting to see how they are inside, like totally mm -hmm. blank uh, chips and uh, custom things. Um, this is from lab at Sintef, where we had a workshop looking at the communication so, uh, between um, the uh, programmer and the, the implants. Uh, this is the programmer paddle that we were talking mm -hmm. about right here that you would hold close to you know, the patient's heart, the pacemaker, and read the data. Um, and the rest should be familiar to mm. all of you. And then I want to tell you another story. So we're not disclosing details from this research, but actually four weeks ago, uh, we got some additional data, which uh, uh, is kind of interesting. I needed to be debugged because my Again. pacemaker failed uh, while I was traveling to give a talk at another conference, hardware, in Amsterdam uh, four weeks ago, up in the air, in the flight, suddenly my pacemaker uh, switched to its uh, backup safety mode. Essentially, what happened, found out later, I didn't know what was happening to me at the time. I just felt a really strange sensation in my heart. It's like my heart was beating really strong. Never felt that before. Uh, I was looking down at my chest and I could see my chest muscle twitching in the in rhythm of my heart. And I was worried that there was a hardware failure of my device because that's the most vulnerable, like physical thing that can go wrong with the pacemaker is that the wires get loose. So I was, uh, I was worrying that the wires had got loose somehow and touched the muscle and made the muscle twitch. So when the flight landed, there was an ambulance waiting for me and I went directly into the hospital to get a checkup. Not only that, um, you'll, you'll have to forgive me for, for swearing a little bit, but it's worth it. Maria is such a badass, she got up on stage and gave a talk about this the next day. Yeah. I think that deserves a round of applause, <laughs> right? So I, think, I think it's very brave of you to get up and talk about all of this stuff and all the vulnerability, like on a personal level, not vulnerability. So, that, so that's personal. me in the hospital in Amsterdam, and there are four different programmers, uh, because they, like, they have a stack of different programmers, uh, because they, of course they don't uh, communicate in a standardized way the with the pacemaker. You need to have the programmer belonging to your pacemaker brand. Um, and I'm looking happy because I just got the confirmation that uh, there's nothing physically wrong with this and uh, um, 
and I just got a reset of my pacemaker and uh, it was uh, then working okay again. But what happened was actually a bit flip in the memory of the device that the, uh, the error uh, correction couldn't uh, correct. Uh, so the RAM was no longer functional. So the pacemaker switched to a safety backup mode that was running only hardware. Uh, and this backup mode felt really different. Um, and so it was interesting when I got in and this is the pacemaker technician looking at the programmer and he sees this error message. Give everyone a chance to read that because yeah. I find this mind blowing. Imagine this error message came out of your body. That's what happened. So that's when I got the confirmation that uh, something where is going on is not me being crazy, it's actually my pacemaker failing. And he told me that some of the other brands of pacemakers, they don't give you this error message if this happens. I asked if he had seen this before. It's a very rare event that this happens to patients. Uh, he has seen like a handful, like uh, less than five times before. And that was with patients that had gone through x-ray uh, examinations. Um, so, also one thing that was good is that the pacemaker actually did uh, a memory dump and there was a uh, crash file created uh, for investigation. And this is not always the case either with all the different implants. So, uh, I'm lucky, uh, my pacemaker had this functionality and I was safe. And you had the presence of mind to ask for it as well, right? And <laughs> Why did this happen to me up in the air? Anyone knows uh, or can guess what happened? <laughs> yeah, probably. It's not uh, uh, confirmed that this was the root cause, but it could be uh, due to cosmic radiation that you get up in the air that can be really powerful and cause bit flips. So, and it's a very rare event. Uh, it's not something uh, that happens a lot. Uh, at my hospital, local hospital, they said I've seen this one time before in a patient. So maybe I travel too much. <laughs> so <laughs> my probability of this happening to me is higher. And why did my muscle twitch in this funny way? Uh, that's because the backup mode um, switches to something called uh, uh, unipolar pacing instead of bipolar pacing. So. Uh, the modern types of pacemakers, they have leads that, uh, um, where the electrical signal flows from the tip of the electrode uh, to a ring electrode above the tip, which is like a small circuit. Uh, but the older type of uh, pacemaker functionality is unipolar. It means that the, the current travels through the whole system and also through your muscle tissue and everything, and it feels really funny. Um, so that's why. That's what happened to me. And you can't always, you know, trust these things. That's also why we're doing this project. So um, I'm here today to tell my story. I'm alive, but there are other cases where patients have died because of faulty devices. Like in this case, there 13 patients died. It was not until a 21-year-old um, died suddenly because his uh, uh, implanted cardiac uh, device failed that they investigated this and it turned out that the producer had hidden this from the FDA. They hadn't informed about this known hardware failure of a lot of devices and they hadn't done a recall. So that's, uh, that's why I don't necessarily trust the vendor when they say, oh, everything is, uh, you should trust us, we have security in place in these devices. We and also we have this uh, recent event where the MedSec uh, team of researchers... Um, they shorted the stocks, they essentially, actually, before, doing, uh, before launching the report, right? Yeah, yeah, they did a similar thing as us. Uh, researching these devices, they found some vulnerabilities, and instead of going to the FDA, instead of going to the vendor, they decided to short the stocks and make money from this in their projects. And you can look up their uh, report uh, uh, online if you if you want to look there's, further There's some good this. technical research there as yeah. well about the approach that they've taken, very similar um, to what you find here. It's, the, it's basically the only ways you can really hack them. So, yeah. But I want to end by saying that there are a lot of ethical consideration you have to do in this field, in this research. And of course, 
patients get scared and upset when uh, there are news stories about pacemakers being hackable. Uh, so that's also why we choose the coordinated disclosure path in this project. Uh, I asked Twitter uh, to get some <laughs> feedback on how people felt about this uh, news uh, when, when the MedSec guys uh, uh, published their report. And most people think it's unethical to do it this way, to make money on like, creating uh, anxiety. But how do the patients really react to this? I'm part of a closed Facebook group for patients with uh, implanted cardiac devices. And many of them actually answered, so I put out this poll on this Facebook group. A lot of them just thought, oh, I'm curious about this. This is, I never thought about this before because they didn't realize that their devices can be hacked. Um, and some were, of course, angry, upset, and uh, felt really affected by this. So we're running out of time. Uh, yeah. I just want to end by saying that, of course, for me, the benefit of having the device clearly outweighs the risks. And I have to just brag about uh, actually running a half marathon <laughs> with my pacemaker uh, when it was working correctly. So. Uh, I'm here today because of this device, and in the future, I guess many of you will also have devices, sensors, different things on your bodies, wearables, and your personal area network. Um, uh, in the, because we are being like human parts of the Internet of Things, uh, we're moving that direction. We can't, uh, we can't like turn around and stop. Yeah, stop you connecting can't really things. Opt out. Uh, so what do we do when we're connecting these things? Um, we're both members of I Am The Cavalry, and this is their Hippocratic yeah. Oath. Um, safer sooner together, you can go and look them up on your own. Um, but essentially, you know, this is the sort of stuff we're all going to have to think about one way or another. Yeah. So, thank you. Yep. It's a pleasure being at 4.6. <laughs> oh. well, thank you. Oh, that's extremely impressive. I think I stand between you two. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks for sharing in the first place. That is, as you say, very personal and very scary in a sense. And it must be very hard to be as knowledgeable as you are of you know, the flaws that your equipment have since you carry it. I mean, most people trust mm. what the doctors does and what the hospital says, and we just do as we're told. But it must be hard for you. But if you ever Actually, get tired, I feel you're... more empowered now, knowing more about mm. how this works. So it's not uh, something that I think is scary. No? Uh, no, I think facts is a good I way to... I think it's to, good to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So well, let's see. We, first of all, we have this survey that says, should we start talking about vulnerabilities in personal critical infrastructure? Yeah, I think that is obvious. And not only that, but also ethical issues mm -hmm. and privacy issues. I mean, if you talk to people who works with... Uh, IOTs these days, they get, you know, this glary, shimmer in their eyes and everything is possible and they don't think mostly. Mm. What do you, what do you, what is well, your Well, there's clearly lots of training opportunities mm -hmm. there, um, not just of people who build the devices, but also people who operate them. So hospital staff having some sense of cybersecurity, which is happening, but, you know, um, there's plenty of opportunity for more training there, I think. We changed. Sorry, <laughs> it feels very awkward. Mm. I thought it was better, but no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go into the, the questions. Yeah, you're giving advice about medical equipment that this is a summit for industrial control systems. <laughs> Do they have anything in common? I, th I think we answered that in the beginning of I think of you did, talk. actually. Yeah. Like I think a cyber-physical thing, like you're controlling uh, systems and processes, and this is my, like, on the, my personal level. Mm. Uh, Your heart is a control process. system, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's an industrial control system that, <laughs> that cleans out your body, right? And provides oxygen to different places. And the, the fact that you have a pacemaker that controls that control system is fascinating, right? So that's the similarity. And hopefully by talking about something a little bit different than ICS, you still get ideas that are helpful for you in your work. And I also think that uh, the medical uh, device industry can learn from the ICS uh, uh, industry. Next question, do you think that any type of medical device have really been designed with focus on cybersecurity? 
Tough question. Um, I, I hate questions like this because I have to go through all the ones I've heard of <laughs> and hope that there's not a counterexample that I can't think of on stage live in front of you. Um, but I have trouble thinking of one. I, I remember there was an article, I think there was one question that we didn't bring up uh, about a robo robotic surgery who had a mm. DOS attack, but that is not really... Well, actually, DOS attacks can affect this too because okay. uh, uh, let's say that uh, you are waiting to get uh, your pacemaker or ICD replaced because of this battery malfunction recall, and you need to be closely monitored by one of these at home uh, to, to get a warning that your battery is running low. Mm -hmm. And if uh, these devices can't connect because of some problem with the, with the internet connection, uh, you might uh, not get that monitoring that you need. Okay. And in a sense, and the warning of low battery running out. The battery draining attack that St. Jude talks about is essentially a DOS as well. It's just a DOS on a physical level that's um, sending messages from the, from the home monitoring unit to the pacemaker and draining the battery uh, frequently. Um, so it's a denial of service on the packet level, but also it's a denial of service if you drain the battery, mm. right? Okay. And what kind of responsibility will the vendor take? I noticed that you are actually allowed to do some tests and you had, had a lot of equipment to work with. Well, the equipment uh, is easily obtainable at eBay. Okay. <laughs> so I Just found like ICS. <laughs> so used I, ones or brand new ones? Uh, used ones. Okay. So uh, the programmer I have in my lab, I bought for $500 on eBay. And these devices are really cheap too. You can find them on eBay. Okay, that's fine. Pacemakers are a little bit harder to get hold of our, our ICDs. And you do get some questions going through customs, right? Mm. Uh, so maybe we get back to that. Can you provide some examples of initial access? I think you made that, or the access vectors for personal. I think you already mentioned that in mm. your presentation. So how can you fast and test frequencies on the pacemaker with yourself in the room? <laughs> <laughs> we could just do a a cage bra. Yeah, so actually that's a problem. I can't, you know, do all this research with myself in the room. I'm yeah. obviously not doing any tests on my own pacemaker mm. in this project. Good, good right. for you. But uh, <laughs> Basic actually, quality assurance, but right? actually that was step when, one. I, when I went in for a checkup in September, uh, there were six or seven recorded um, events uh, that said I was too close to a magnet uh, because there are some magnet activation of different things on the pacemaker. In my case, if I have a strong magnet close to my pacemaker, it will turn out verbose logging. So I can use that if I feel funny. I can put the magnet on top of my pacemaker and it will uh, capture an ECG of the heart and some extra logging. And this had happened six or seven times and I it was like, hmm, I didn't apply my magnet. I didn't feel funny. What can this be? And then I saw the date, and that was one of the days we were working in the lab. So I, I was too close to the magnet on the programmer head. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> but it didn't really do anything wrong with the with oh, pacemaker. Good. But the, the question is absolutely correct. Yeah. Faraday cages can be useful. I have yeah. a Faraday bag um, from Privacy International, where I'm based at the moment. Um, and you can get Faraday cages, you know, small enough for mobile phones and up to different sizes if you want to do um, fuzzing of the pacemaker specifically. Yeah, okay. This is absolutely fascinating. And I suggest that you go downstairs to the Geek Launch and talk more to Iran and Maria. Thank you so very much. Thank you, for six. And... You will, of course, get these <laughs> absolutely precious diplomas <laughs> and a great thank you for sharing this information. Thank you thank very, you. very much. Cool. Now I finally have a and degree. It's a small gift as well coming huh? with that. It's thank heavy, you. though. Thank there you. you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, well, you are going downstairs. Mm -hmm.